Good morning, Fairmount Wesleyan, and thank you for joining us again this Sunday for Worship Online. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Let the sea resound in everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord. Wherever you are this morning, I invite you just to join in with creation and worship our God for the marvelous things that he's done. Peace. 
sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Good morning from Mount Wesleyan Church. Good morning. And thank you once again for joining us for worship. Obviously, uh, we are in a different kind of setting today. Uh, We decided to do things a little different. And so we are recording this sermon uh, in our kitchen or in our house and uh, inviting you in uh, to the Lutke residence here to to worship with us. And I have uh, my better half. Uh, helping me today, so hopefully the sermon is much better uh, today. So um, I want to start off with asking us to do a little experiment, if you will, or a a time of reflection. So I want to give you a couple different scenarios and ask you to take some time to just feel what the emotions are, uh, what the feelings are, the thoughts that come to your mind are. And so if you need to kind of close your eyes to uh, picture these things. You're welcome to do so. Just don't fall asleep. But uh, I want to I want to paint a picture for us of a couple different scenarios. The first one is I want you to imagine a household where everybody is on the same page, where everybody gets along, where there is encouragement, there is peace, there is uh, a collaboration from. Uh, every family member, every person that walks in that household. I want you just to feel that. I want you to to imagine that. Now, I want you to imagine the opposite household. I want you to imagine a household that is filled with tension and filled with strife and negativity and harsh comments and uh, just an attitude or an environment that that just feels heavy, that just doesn't feel right. Um, I want you to imagine the the emotional response that comes with that kind of thought. Now I want you to think about 
the place you work, or the school that you go to. Again, think of the situation where everybody is together, everybody uh, enjoys each other's company, uh, there is uh, fun, there is an excitement, there is energy, compared to the environment where you dread going to work or you dread going to school. Uh, there's negativity. There are cliques. There are um, just this, this sense of people that oppose you or you oppose them and, and just the, the tension of that environment. Man, there's two opposite ends of both of those kind of scenarios um, of peace as well as of friction and, and tension. And that's going to weigh in on uh, some of what we're going to talk about here in a little bit as we continue our study in Colossians. Paul is writing to a group of Christians, and we've got to remember that, that he's writing to Christians uh, to the church in Colossae. And he is letting them know that their life can be so much greater with Jesus. And so today, we're going to continue that thought, continue to study Colossians. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. But today, we're going to look at how with Jesus, we can have greater peace. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to dig into God's Word together this morning. So let's have a word of prayer as we get started, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll go. Well, Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you again for today. Thanks for a chance to, uh, to learn from you, to continue to seek you, to continue just to uh, journey in this relationship that you've called us with. Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll... You will anoint the words that come out of my mouth as well as Amy's mouth and, and hide us behind the cross. And Heavenly Father, as we, as we uh, unfold and unpackage this scripture, will you allow it to come alive in each one of us, that we will hear it, that we'll respond to it, and that Heavenly Father will give you the glory for it in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at Colossians 3. 15 through Colossians 4 verse 1. There's 12 verses here. And before I read that, I want you to be have, have your antenna up for a couple of different things. One is when I was reading these 12 verses over and over, what stood out to me, one of the first things that stood out was how the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord, God, Master, all referring to God himself, just rose up and I counted, there's 11 times in 12 verses that he is mentioned. And so I even took a yellow colored pencil and just circled and colored in every time I saw Jesus or God or Master, and now it just leaps off my page here. So watch for that, how Paul emphasizes over and over, have Christ the center, have Christ the center. And so that's the first thing I want you to be thinking of as we read these scriptures. And then at the tail end of the scriptures, it gives different scenarios, different hats or roles that people play, and it gives us a job if we happen to have one of those roles. So I want you to listen for a role that you may play, or you may play more than one. Wives, if you're a wife, if you're a husband, a parent, a child. Uh, a slave, a master. And now in our culture, we don't have slaves and masters necessarily, but we do have employees and employers or students and teachers. So think about those things as we read this passage. Let's look at Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ Dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. 
Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Wow. So last week we looked at Paul's writing in chapter 3, earlier in chapter 3, where Paul is calling us out as Christians. He's calling out the Christians in Colossae. And he's telling us that uh, if we are going to claim Christ as our Lord, then there must be a difference in our life from the world. Our lifestyle has to look different. Our attitude has to look different. The way we talk has to look different. There has to be something that separates us from the world. And so we studied last week that Paul is giving this instruction that we need to take off the old self, take off the life that we used to live, the, the life that uh, uh, was with the world, and take that off. And he actually says to put it to death and then to put on uh, the characteristics of Christ or to put on the virtues, as, as, as Paul says, the virtues of Christ. And, uh, and for the last few weeks, We've been talking about this idea of having a Christ-centered life. Um, and so, Amy, I want to put you on the spot and ask you, what does that look like for you uh, when you see a person that has a Christ-centered life? What, what stands out? What's the attitude? What's the lifestyle look like um, in a general sense for, for a person? Well, I think the first thing that I think of is their love some love exuding out of them, their kindness. Uh, you can just tell that there's something different about them. But then as I would were to get to know someone, they want to talk about Jesus Christ. They are they're deep in the word. They want to learn and put themselves in a position to hear from him, grow in him. And so that that's someone that I know is is deeply committed, who's willing to go and dive into the word, to wait upon his spirit, to tell them what decision to make or which way to go or to rest in him and, and wait, even though they might be in a chaotic situation. Yeah. So we, as we've kind of been trying to describe this idea of what a, a Christ-centered life looks like, uh, we're, we're going along the lines that a Christ-centered life is one that we are allowing Jesus to exist in our life, to fill us up. And then when we are uh, out of out of the resources of who Jesus is, we're able to be parents. We're able to be spouses. We're able to be employees. Uh, we're able to do the things in life that God has called us to. And so it's not picking and choosing when God is a part of our life, but it's this idea that we are constantly uh, being drawn in to the resources of who Jesus is, uh, and then uh, that overflow is what allows us uh, to have that Christ-centered life. So we, we've talked about this idea of putting to death the old and uh, taking it off, throwing it away because it doesn't represent Christ. It doesn't represent who Jesus wants us to be. And then last week we, we shared in chapter 3 uh, where Paul tells us to put on the virtues and he lists a handful of those, compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness uh, patience. And then he says, we need to love or we need to forgive each other because Christ forgives us. Um, and then in 14, uh, verse 14 of chapter three, Paul says to put on love, which binds all of them together in perfect unity. All of those characteristics uh, that we have that represent Christ, now we're supposed to include love with that. And we get this idea that love is the great unifier. Love is the one that kind of ties the bow onto all of those things and brings them to life and makes them work together. Um, as we started studying this passage, uh, starting in verse 15 on of chapter 3, uh, over the last few days and, and you know, kind of wrestling with where God wants us to go, the one thing that uh, continued to stand out in my mind 
was the phrase in verse 15, let the peace of Christ uh, rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule. And um, I mean, we got to remember that Paul is talking to Christians. Uh, he's, he's writing to us as Christians, and he's, he's wanting us to understand, like, there is something about our life that needs to be ruled by God. Um, and, and the interesting thing, doing some studying, the word rule is, ath- is an athletic term that we could easily substitute with the word umpire. And so picture this, let the, let the, the peace of Christ umpire your life. Just like the umpire in a baseball game calls the balls and strikes and has to keep the peace with both sides of the dugouts, um, we allow the peace of Christ to be the one who helps us decide what our life's going to be about. A lot of uh, Paul's writings uh, that he writes to the different churches and to Christians, he talks about this peace, uh, this relationship with the Lord. In uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, he writes a letter to the church in Philippi, and he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And so this, this peace of God, we can't necessarily completely understand it. We can't uh, put connect the dots necessarily. It's, it's, it's beyond our understanding. But it will change us when we're living in the peace of, of Christ. And so I started asking myself this question, like, what is the peace of Christ? What's that look like? Um, trying to, again, come up with some definition. And I, I wrote down that the peace of Christ is a surrendered life. It's the right life. It's a humbled life. It's a courageous life. It's a countercultural life. It's a sacrificial life. Uh, uh, the peace of Christ's life is an others-focused kind of life. And, and so what we see is the, this conversation with Paul, as he is writing this letter to Christians, to us, he's saying, I don't want you just to have uh, peace from Jesus. I want you to have the same peace that Jesus had. Mm-hmm. While Jesus is in the midst of turmoil and goes through trials, and goes through accusations, and goes through persecution, and goes through all these storms of life, he still has this calmness, he still has this security in his soul, because he is connected to the Father. He's connected to God. And I, I wonder if, uh, if that's what Paul's trying to help us understand, is that the closer we, we get in our relationship with our Lord, the more we begin to understand and begin to operate in this peace of Christ um, that, that he provides. Ran across a, a quote from Billy Graham. He says, the world fights for peace. It negotiates for peace. It maneuvers for peace. But there is no ultimate peace in the world. But Jesus gives peace to those who put their trust in him. You know, Jesus gives peace to those who are living in that relationship, that are continuing to pursue him. And, uh, and I think that that's what we're supposed to be seeking after. I think that's what we're supposed to embrace. And I think that it's, it's even something we're supposed to celebrate. I mean, because Paul, in uh, verse 15, he, he's talking about this peace of Christ. And then he goes, and be thankful. And I don't think that's an afterthought. Like, uh, oh, hey, by the way, be, be thankful. I think it's because there are so many people that miss out on the peace of Christ that if you are able to allow Christ and that relationship and, and uh, just his peace, his connection to rule, to umpire your life, all of a sudden that's something to be thankful for because it's, it's quickly lost or it's quickly forgotten. Um, and then he goes on uh, in verse 16. In verse 16, I think it's like he helps us understand how we're supposed to be rooted to Christ and, and maybe a picture of what that looks like for the peace of Christ to actually take root, to come alive, to continue to, to grow. And so uh, it's a lifestyle change that, that we, have to, we have to make. Uh, where, where Jesus is enough, 
uh, his love is enough, and that's what we're pursuing on a regular basis. So I have an idea. It comes out of counseling, but it's a metaphor that I have used in systems, family systems mostly, but whatever system you're a part of, a school system or a work system, it's the idea of a mobile hanging over a crib. So let's see if I can use my hands while I'm holding the mic. But if you think of this mobile hanging over a crib, and you pull one toy, all the other toys or whatever's dangling down have to create, have to adjust to create e equilibrium for that mobile again and for it to come back. And so as we think about this concept, how in the world can I respond in peace in every situation? How in the world do I function out of love when I'm so irritated or so stressed out or you know, fill in the blank? If we're imagining some of those scenes, some of us may be a part of the ones that are chaotic and drama-filled. So I want to suggest that like this mobile, if you were, let's say you're the one toy that gets pulled, you're the one that puts yourself in a place to put Christ as center, and all you do is make one small tweak in life. It's just a baby step. You're not all the way there, 100% maybe, but you make an adjustment to respond in calm, in peace, and turn it over to Christ. Take a deep breath, turn it over to Christ. Whether that's a screaming child or a belligerent coworker or whatever, whatever whoever you might be thinking of, Everybody else around you will then have to adjust because you're reacting differently than anybody else who has reacted mm. or any other time that you have reacted. And so even small adjustments that you take back into your home or you take back into your workplace or in your school, people begin, you can change a whole system that way. Just being one person, making one adjustment until you grow a little more and you make another adjustment. Everybody else has to adjust themselves. Hmm. I, I bet, I mean, that plays, that comes alive in the, the world that we live in today uh, with the tension and the, uh, the chaos and the uncertainty and the fear and all the different things that come with, uh, with COVID and, you know, governments and all that. Like, how do we, I think that maybe this is timely because it speaks to how we can still live in peace, yes. Yes. how we can still find balance in our life and find God's love that helps us grow. So let's, let's look into verse 16 here. Um, there's three different things that I think Paul uh, gives us as advice on how we can continue to allow that peace of Christ to grow. So it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude, in your heart. I, I think the, the three different things that jump out to me here is one is remaining in the word. Um, it says to dwell in the word. And, and the, the picture behind this is to inhabit in order to influence. And so we want the word of God to be in us, to continue to, to change us, to influence the direction we go. And uh, it talks about that being a rich, a richness to it. Uh, let the, the word of, of Christ dwell in you richly, abundantly. Let it come alive. Now, we got to remember in this day when Paul's writing this, the people of the, the Roman Empire, it was all about intellect. It was about the, you know, who was smarter and who, who had this philosophy and different kind of things. And so when Paul is talking, he's saying, instead of chasing after all of these various philosophies and all these other random thoughts, he goes, go to the Word. Go to the Word and allow the Word to come alive. Allow the Word to teach you, to train you, to, to help you grow. Allow the Word to be the one that helps rule or umpire what your response in life is going to look like. Bryce and I were just talking about reading the Word uh, a couple weeks ago, and he wanted my opinion, wanted to talk through uh, if he should just read through the Bible, or is, is there a better way to get into the Word, uh, use a devotion book, whatever. And he really wanted to get into the Word and not necessarily a devotion book at this point. And so he was thinking of reading through the Bible in a year. And... I encourage that. Anytime he wants to get into the Word, 
absolutely, go for it. Uh, but as we talked, we kind of just talked through different ways that he could do that. I said, yes, you could go at it uh, and do it in a whole year and accomplish that, see the Bible in big chunks. And there is something really beautiful about that, being able to read three chapters a day or, or more or several chapters in a psalm, and you're seeing a bigger picture than maybe just a small amount. And so that definitely has a place as you're reading through the word or, or trying to figure out what you're going to do. I said, there's another way to consider reading the Bible, and that's going very slowly and just having small chunks or even one verse and just breathing it in, imagining yourself in the scene or imagining Jesus doing that thing for you, whatever it might be. So either way you go about it, there is... The, the word is alive and active. It will not return void, which mm. means it's a quote from the Old Testament, which means it yeah. will change you. Yeah. And, and so I encouraged my son, go through the whole Bible and, and do that once and then maybe do it again and then go slower and you're not in a race to get it done in a year. Uh, so different ways, maybe you could listen to the Bible uh, on uh, digital podcasts or as you ride to work whatever you might uh, be able to get your, your hands on, but get that word in you. Yeah, yeah. That, that word, let it dwell in you richly. The second thing goes on to uh, uh, this idea of others, being connected with others. It says uh, that word will dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. And, and so we're made for community. Um, we're made for relationships. And, uh, you know, the Right now, there's this phrase, we're all in this together, right? And we are. We are all in this together. But here's the thing. As Christians, we're all in this together. This pursuit of Christ, of knowing who Jesus is, of making right decisions and, and continuing in our spiritual journeys, we're in this together. We need one another to hold us accountable. We need each other to, sh you know, it's the iron sharpens iron. We need to... Uh, uh, just push each other, help answer questions for each other. That's why, you know, Sunday school classes, discipleship groups, uh, small groups, those kind of things are so valuable because it's a chance and opportunity in an intimate setting to, to be vulnerable and also allow others to be vulnerable with you. And, and it's this ongoing, you know, teaching and admonishing one another uh, kind of principle. Oh, I have to chime in here too. The the small group that have, have logged on online with me, it's, it's five or six uh, people, and we are in different age, we're a couple different seasons in our uh, group. There's a couple different ages, uh, definitely everybody dealing with their own stuff, uh, and me being one, looking for a job, somebody else is a recent widow, and so everybody's kind of got their own, and we've come together, and it's been so beautiful Last week in particular, we were talking about how to put off the old sinful nature and to put on the clothing of compassion and kindness and patience. And one of us said, I'm not very good at compassion. I don't know how to put that on. And they just were vulnerable, and they confessed that to us. And so we, dis we started to talk about it. Well, how do some of the other ones of us that may be okay with compassion do with that? And she was able to learn from us. There was another one of us said, I'm terrible at patience. And so then we talked about that. How do we develop patience? Is it something that comes naturally? Most of us say, absolutely not. And so how do we do it? So it was a, a really great conversation where ironing was sharpening iron. We, we all had gifts in different areas and were able to give to the ones that felt weaker. And nobody was put down. Nobody felt like they were less than. In Christianity, there's no spiritual elitism. No. Like somebody's got a corner on the market in love and, and does so much better. It's just putting yourself before the cross and saying, here I am with all my failures this week. And so I Well, God creates that. us so unique, and we have different gifts and abilities that weigh in together. And when all those come together into the kingdom, man, we can do some amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. That's that idea of others. We need others. And then the third part of this one verse here is that we need to, uh, uh, with wisdom, remember, with wisdom we're helping each other, uh, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to God. There is this element of worship that, uh, 
that helps us know the peace of Christ. My mom, I can't remember the exact jingle, but she had some jingle that she used to sing or say, but basically it was, you know, when junk comes in, junk comes out. And it was this principle, like, what are you feeding into your life? What are you feeding into your mind? What are you feeding into your heart? And, uh, and so if we're focused on worship, if we're, we're listening to Christian music, um, if our, our peer group that's influencing us are Christians, uh, then that's obviously going to change our environment. Now, we're supposed to have non-Christians that we can help make a difference into their lives. But um, this idea of, man, worship, living in such a, a way that we are continuing to grow and give God praise um, man, you know, for me, worship is being in nature, uh, and just being outside in the quiet. Um, but so, you know, what is that worship element? Uh, cause I can't sing worth a lick. So that verse kind of, you know, Paul shoots me out of the water there. So, but, but there is an element of worship that helps us understand what the peace of Christ is. I had a two year old just this last week and just guess a lot of lessons these last couple weeks. Uh, remind me of this. I had my small group over. We were outside doing a, a fire and s'mores, and the LaRoe family came over, if, if you know them, Sean and Kristen and their little two-and-a-half-year-old Carter. And Kristen and I and Carter were in the garage, and we were talking, and Carter was finding golf balls. And then he heard something, and he stopped, and he said, What's that? And Krista and I didn't hear what he heard, and so we didn't hear anything. But right then, the refrigerator in the garage kicked on. And then he's like, what's that? And that was an opportunity for Kristen and I to tell Carter, that's the refrigerator. Let's thank, thank God for, we have, for the food that's in there. And what if the heat were to kick on in our house? Thank God that we have a warm house or an air-conditioned house. What if we heard the birds? There's a verse in Matthew that says, look at the birds of the air. Be watchful. Ponder the lilies of the field. Be attentive to where God is at work and all he's providing for us. Then an attitude of gratefulness will fall over us. And so Carter demonstrated that. We were just talking away, and he was alert to things that were happening around him that we just took for granted. Mm -hmm. And that's a way that we can worship, whether we can sing or not. Right, right. Because our, our goal is to have this Christ-centered life. And I think in verse 17, kind of Paul kind of puts a bow on this, and he's like, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and give thanks to God the Father through him. Um, you know, all that we do, everything we say, everything we, uh, every action we make, uh, our work ethic, all those different things, it's, it's in the name of Jesus. It is out of love. It is out of the characteristics of God. It is um, out of the peace of God that we choose to do those things, which then helps us form and develop this Christ-centered life that, that just then expands. It just points everybody to Jesus uh, through us. It's not us. It, you know, we want to be hidden. Uh, we want Jesus to be seen um, in our life. That peace of Christ. Let that peace of Christ umpire who we are, who we're choosing. Um, and when we do that, we can't help but to uh, stand out. We can't help but to be unique in our world. Uh, be, it should be a, a stark difference uh, between the two. So. Well, then the passage takes off into some very practical advice, starting in verse 18 with wives and then traveling down through those six roles that I mentioned at the beginning. What is interesting is that we each role it gives has something to do if we're going to live Christ-centered and peace-filled lives. And as I pondered this and studied it and, and thought about it, Something hit me, and I think I'm going to use the word O, O-W-E. It tells us if we're choosing to be Christ followers, then our servant minds should focus on what we owe others, not what is owed to us and not what we deserve and what we're going to demand. And so as we walk through this, I'll probably remind us of this, and I, my toes were stepped on, so <laughs> we're going to do some toe step in here dancing. Uh, Wives, submit to your husbands. 
husbands, love your wives. So we see here and we see in other passages, especially in Ephesians 5, where it says the same things. There's this mutual love and respect that needs to come between love or between husband and wife to love and to submit to one another. And I think about husbands and wives. I think about the two of us uh, finding our way. We, we're going to celebrate 24 years in, of marriage this year. And so we have gotten down the road a little ways, but all oh, those first years, uh, we could, we could res- withhold love and submission. We could show a lack of love or submission verbally or even non-verbally by rolling our eyes or, or storming off. And so how do we do this hard thing that the Bible tells us? How do I decide I'm a Christ follower? I owe it to my husband to submit because he's loving me, and so he'll make it easy for me to sub- submit if he's not being harsh with me or abusive. And so it's mutual, uh, mutual there. But what and, if... And, and it's Christians. Paul's writing to Christians. Yeah. Uh, and so we got to keep that in context that, I mean, we're talking to individuals who have given their lives to Christ and, mm-hmm. and what that marriage relationship looks like. And, and with the peace of Christ ruling, yeah. with the peace of Christ being the umpire, now all of a sudden we see our spouse as God sees them, uh, mm-hmm. not necessarily the way we want them to be seen. Yeah. Right? So. And that might take purposeful, and I'm, I'm talking baby steps again, Christ right. is greater, so this actually can happen if we allow him to, to be in us, working through us. I really love uh, something that I've heard from Jeff and Katie McNutt. I'm just going to just bring up everybody in the church, <laughs> I guess. Uh, they have talked about their marriage, and they have described uh, some of their disagreements, I guess, for lack of a better word. Uh, their marriage is a rope, and then what if they ended up with a knot in their rope, a disagreement that has popped up? If they each stay on the end of their rope, and pull, that knot is only going to get tighter Mm -hmm. and is harder to uh, work out because they're fighting against one another. And they have said that through their, oh, let's see, I think they got married in 2011-ish. So in their nine years of marriage, they have tried in disagreement times to step away from the rope and look at the knot together and that they would work on that knot as a team so it's them against the problem, not them against one another. And I really love that as they are trying to become one in Christ and, and make him uh, the ruler of their home. Then it goes on to talk about children. So if there's any kids listening, all of us are a child in one way or another and are called to honor our father and mother, but particularly the ones that are still in the home, kids, teenagers, it says, obey your parents in everything. And I want to just give you a challenge. Uh, it, takes, it takes work when we feel like we're always being asked to obey, and we're never the ones that get to be in charge. But as you obey, that is an act of love that you are doing for Jesus Christ, and to do that with a good attitude if you can. Uh, allow your parents to lead you so that you can mature, and you're showing maturity when you obey and when you love your parents like that. Yeah, obviously, you know, a two-year-old throwing a tantrum on the floor doesn't represent the peace of Christ, and it takes the peace of Christ away from us uh, <laughs> in those moments. Yeah. But we're supposed to we're supposed to model that. We're supposed to teach them. We're supposed to help them mature in in their faith just as much as in life, mm-hmm. uh, so that they a child at some point can also live in that sense that I'm going to be obedient to Christ and I'm going to be I'm going to obey my parents because I'm obedient to Jesus. Mm. Um, and that changes, our, that changes the look of things. So. Then it addresses fathers in verse 21, or we might expand that to say parents. Do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. I see this as something that really does happen. When I think about kids that I've worked with, they if they have really harsh parents that are very quick to punish without trying to understand or listen, and definitely we need to be consistent in our discipline parents and we need to, we need to discipline, but there may be parents that uh, go too far in their uh, harshness, I guess is, is the only word I'm thinking of right now, 
that eventually the kids do become discouraged. I, I see them turning things inward as if they're terrible people, not they made a mistake and need to be have correction, but they are awful and they they can't get anything right. They always make a mess or they are stupid. Whatever uh, wording that se- starts to play in their brain, that's when kids begin to close down. And then later on, you see them rebelling or just isolating themselves, kind of depending on the personality of the child. And it shouldn't be when when parents are overly harsh or nag, nag too much. Oh, man, I, I want to challenge... All of us that are parents right now, you know, find a time today to let your kids know how much you love them. Mm. Uh, Let them know how much you appreciate them, how much you value them. Uh, List list the characteristics of who they are uh, instead of pointing out the flaws. We all know our flaws; those are easy. Um, But but let's let's as parents let's let's change let's be different than the world and uh, let's let's let the peace of Christ rule and let's make that decision that we're gonna. We're going to love our kids. So I noticed that with us. And please, I feel like I just need to remind us once again, this is all done through Christ. We can't do it on our own. And so he has got to be the one that just works through us and changes us little by little. We are not suggesting that you're horrible if you ever make a mistake, because I think I'm the queen of mistakes. But one thing I noticed that worked was when my, our kids felt loved and they had affection they ended up respecting the discipline much, much more. Eventually, you know, at, at times there's a blow up and everybody has to calm down. But when they know their love deep down, that goes much farther. The, the discipline can go much farther than if they're only disciplined and not shown affection and love. Sure. All right, well, moving on, we got slaves and masters, and so I, I had thrown out the idea maybe we could take that into employees uh, and students. Uh, they're called to obey and have integrity. So again, I'll remind us, uh, what as Christ followers, what do we owe our workplace? What do we owe our teachers when they ask us to complete an assignment? Uh, not what do they owe us. Uh, if we really want to be Christ-centered and peace, peacefully driven. So when we choose to work in a place, we have chosen to submit to those bosses, to those employers. We chose to say yes to that amount of money. We, we chose to do our best uh, for that particular company. And yet, when I've worked at different places, and I've got Christian places in mind and non-Christian places in mind, what I have seen in in several places is that as soon as the boss or the employer is manager is out of earshot or not around, the backbiting that starts, the gossip, the the negativity, pulling people down, pulling our leaders down. I, I see on social media. I it, all right. I'm I'm back into the workplace. Sorry. I, went off on a tangent there, but we should be a, a people that will work hard when people, when our bosses see us or they don't, we should not join in the break, break room gossip. We should be ones that are diligently working for the Lord and not joining in any sort of venom or poison that's happening to keep unrest and lack of peace in our workplace taking taking all off the old putting on the new taking off the world putting on christ and so how do we stand out and and be different in that world yeah and and paul even talks about the master that uh you know the master even though he's in charge he answers to a higher authority he still answers to his master and that is god um who's much more powerful and uh and so bosses, leaders still have to submit um, to Christ. And, uh, and God's able to do that. God's able to, to change us. God's able to help us in those various roles, in, uh, in those, all those different, different pieces of life when, when we are committed to Him, when we're sold out to Him, when we're listening uh, to the Holy Spirit, when we're, we're waiting for God to work and lead and guide. Um, it can happen. 
I love so. the word that ver- chapter four, verse one says, masters provide. So employers, teachers provide. How, what's a step you could take to provide the atmosphere of peace, to provide the atmosphere of love, to provide the work conditions that these employees want to have integrity for you? Uh, or want to complete their work 100% and not just get by with the bare minimum. I love that word. All right. Well, I want to I want us to all uh, dedicate ourselves to being all in with Jesus. Um, to make that part of our life goal to uh, you know, it's a day-to-day goal sometimes. Uh, that we're all in, we're allowing God to to refine us, to reshape us. Uh, to forgive us of our sins, to remove that, that filth. Uh, but we're doing our part as well to be diligent in, in pursuing Him and, and His characteristics. We're reading God's Word. We're worshiping. We're allowing other people to, to help us so that we can, we can live in the peace of Christ. And we can, we can allow that peace that Jesus has, that Jesus provides, uh, to help us in the midst of trials, in the midst of decisions, in the midst of the what-ifs, um, and we know we have this this assurance of who God is and that we're His children. And so I hope that this week, um, as as this passage comes to mind, as you go through situations, I hope that you can put it into practice and and make it real, and uh, and we'll together grow into who God wants us to be. Thanks for joining us, and uh, continue to uh, continue to reach out, continue to love. Um, we will continue to do our part as a as the church uh and and standing out for christ and letting the world see something different so we love you we thank you we'll see you next week love you